Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, John Anthony. He is the founder of Sustainable Freedom Lab. It is a nationally, he's a nationally acclaimed speaker, researcher, and writer. He is a leading expert on globalist impacts on local affairs and the effects of federal agency regulations on personal lives and, pr and property rights. Mr. Anthony's Property Value Defense Network informs public officials and attorneys nationwide of the dangers of regulatory laws. His workshop, Shattering America's Trance, teaches conservatives effective techniques for cross-political communications and will soon be available as an online course. And we want to welcome John Anthony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, whoops, self-governance. That was great. Bill, I, I absolutely love that. And the idea of bringing folks together, I mean, that, that, that really is it. Um, I spent 25 years <clears throat> as the owner, founder of a company called Corporate Measures. And what we did for those 25 years is we would take companies that weren't doing very well, and we'd help, helpfully help them to do really, really well. So no matter what kind of a business we entered, whether it was an oil company we'd done business for, you know, entertainment companies, hair care product companies we've, we've all worked with, we found that no matter how difficult the challenge was, if you were willing to look at things exactly as they were, not sugarcoat anything, but just take the issue exactly as it was, we could solve virtually any problem. And the other thing we had to do was work side by side. We didn't care who had, a, had a, an agenda, who had a background concern. We focused only on the issue and what we could solve, and that's what we're going to do here today. We're going to take a, little, take a little bit of a look at property rights. I call this how HUD controls your property rights. <clears throat> and we're going to look at how we got to a point that some of these federal agencies were so phenomenally powerful. And when we see how we got to the point that they're powerful, we're going to look at one specific agency, HUD, and the impact that it has not only communities in general, but on Greenville, and see just how that's going to impact your future if they continue on the road they are. We're also going to look at what can we do to change the things that are happening right now. So we're very much about not just looking at the problem, but, but kind of looking at the solution. Property rights in America matter, but we've kind of forgotten that. We talk about life, liberty, and property. What you might not realize is that our founding fathers recognized that the most, important, the most important of these was property. Because if I don't, if, if I don't have complete control of my property, if I don't have my property rights, then it's difficult for you to have your human rights. For instance, if you buy an automobile, you say, well, that's my car. I paid my money, and now I've got this really neat car to drive around in. But if I tell you you can only drive this on certain days, and you can only drive it so far, and you can only use it uh, during certain times of the year, who owns the car? The fact is, not only do you not own the car that you paid for, I own you because now I'm able to control your behavior. And that's the essence of property. If somebody else is able to manipulate and use your property to their ends, then they not only own the property, they're also able to manage your behavior. So we're going to look a little bit closer at this. Our founding father back in 1787, James Madison, at the Constitutional Convention, he said the United States have a precious advantage in the universal hope of acquiring property. We saw the value of property. And even today in Washington State, uh, Chief Justice out there of the uh, State Supreme Court said, if the right of use be denied of, of our property, the value of property is annihilated. So we've heard of things where sometimes people will give up some of the rights to their property, maybe, maybe a, to a, a, a conservation easement. If you give up the right of use, the property itself is annihilated. Strong words, but we have to look at it. So how did we get from the point where all of a sudden today, we're going we're to look at a few people here, how do we ever get to the point that we've forgotten about what those property rights mean and why they matter so much? Our founders told it, told us that. And Throughout history, we've seen to say property rights are important, and yet look what's happening here. This woman, Jenny Granato, lives in Ohio. And an unelected council decided that they wanted to have a, a, a bicycle path about a foot from, oh, I don't know, about five or six feet from her front doorstep. She fought this thing with everything she had, lived in that house for years, it was a classic historical structure that she lived in. She could not stop it. That bicycle path is there today, no matter how hard she tried to get rid of it. Over here, we have Plan Bay Area. This is in San Francisco. An unelected board 
tells people where they can live. They put them in preferred development areas. In some cases, they're actually taking minority families and they're pushing them into areas where they don't even particularly want to live, but they have no choice. In fact, it's reached the point now, and maybe this is a good thing, we actually have the left and the right out there. You've got Democrats and Republicans side by side fighting this to try to stop that. That's happening in different countries, uh, uh, cities across the country. Over here we have in Portland, Oregon, they had this grand new smart growth scheme that they were gonna, they were, they were gonna uh, implement in the town, and it does. It's a beautiful town, it's been written up in the New York Times five times. It's such a be beautiful town to visit. The only problem is you can't afford to live there. <coughs> So the minority families who lived in there, 10,000 minorities between, uh, between 2000 and 2010, according to the U.S. Census, they were forced out of town. So they now live on the outer perimeter because they've lost their lovely homes in the center of town. King County, Washington set up a rule, and this rule said that if you owned a piece of property in this county, 65, <coughs> five acres or over, 65% of that land has to be turned, returned to its natural vegetative state. That means you can't mow it, you can't cut it. If a tree falls down, you can't even take the wood off of that tree. You have to leave it alone. That's your property. On the rest of the property, <clears throat> only a maximum of 10% of that land can have an impervious structure on it. So that means if you want to put a swimming pool, a driveway, a garage, a shed in there, that can only be on 10% of the land. That's what happens when people's property is, their rights are taken away from them. Uh, in northeastern uh, New Jersey, navigable waterway, there, actually there's a friend of mine in, uh, in northern New Jersey, a former public official. He had a little stream in his backyard. He's got four acres of land. The EPA came in and declared that stream a navigable waterway and they took it over and they told him he had to have a 300 foot buffer on each side. Now what happens to the value of your property when somebody puts 600 feet of buffer, even if you do have four acres of land? All of a sudden the property value plummets because when you fill out that disclosure statement, if you try to sell the property, it's not gonna be worth as much any longer. So they've now affected not just his behavior, they've also affected his net worth as that began to plummet. Over here we have Andy Johnson out in Fort Bridge, uh, Wyoming. He put a stock pond in his backyard. This is his yard, he dug a stock pond, he stocked it. By the way, he went to, to Wyoming, went to Cheyenne, Wyoming. He went to the engineers there and they signed off and they said, this is fine. The EPA came in and said, no, you can't have that there. Get it out or it's gonna cost you $75,000 a day. He's fighting it. Now so far he hasn't paid any of that 75,000, but here's kind of a wrinkle you ought to know about this, to give you an idea where federal agencies go. They charge him $75,000 a day, but they can't actually collect that money until a court says they can. So they have to go to court. So what the EPA did was they filed another ruling. They issued, excuse me, they issued another regulation. And that regul regulation said, we don't have to go to court. If we want to take the money, we'll just take the money. So they, that, it, that, once word of that regulation got out, a lot of people wrote back and they pushed back. Gina McCarthy, the head of the EPA, she said, gee, I can't imagine why people were so upset. It seemed like such a minor thing. That's how powerful these federal agencies have become. We want to take a look at what happened. Oh, okay. Oops. Isn't this a slide? Yeah, okay. All right. Under this, under this ruling, affirmatively furthering fair housing, uh, this is a ruling that HUD just came out with in July of last year. Uh, if you ever heard of affirmatively furthering fair housing, raise your hand. That's more than most people. Okay, we've got about four in here I've heard of it. Okay, we're gonna go into exactly what it is, but it controls fair housing here in the United States now. If you sign on to a HUD grant, what can happen now in your community is we can, the HUD can overturn voters' decisions, they can control local uh, zoning and land use, and they can force your community to join a region. Now this sounds, wow, how can they do all these things? Well, we're gonna go through it step by step. I'm gonna show you exactly how this happens, and I'm going to show you communities where in fact it already is happening. So how did we get here? How did we get from the point of you know, life, liberty, and property, and respecting the value of it, all of a sudden to a point where somebody can just walk in and take our, value, our property anytime they want to? How, how do you get there? Well, to do that, we're gonna do a little historical journey. We're gonna start back in Vancouver on a kind of a drip dry rainy day in, uh, in June in 1976. There's a group of people that got together. The UN had put this meeting together. The United States was there. And there's a preamble to land in, a, in an action plan that had to be filled out. So this action plan reads as follows. 
land cannot be controlled by individuals and subject to the inefficiencies of the market. Private land is a principal means of accumulation of wealth, and therefore it's socially unjust. And down here we said social justice can only be achieved if land is used in the interest of society as a whole. Now this meeting was one of several habitat meetings that the, you know, that the UN had. And, but by habitat, what they're saying is, if we can take an area where, where man can live, we're going to be able to protect our planet a lot better. If we can put you like in one area and then like create a growth boundary around that, kind of a regional type of thing, if we can do that, that's kind of the philosophy that, that we believe in. What, what this little paragraph up here, these two paragraphs do, is they establish the UN's position on the relationship between man and property. Now look at that compared to our, to our US Constitution, where property rights are protected. Well, here, it's complete opposite of that. Now, normally, this would have meant absolutely nothing, because this is the UN, and half the time, we just pay the bill, and we don't pay attention to what they do anyway. Except this guy was there, William K. Riley. William K. Riley signed off on that for the United States of America. And he said, yes, we agree that the ownership of property is socially unjust, and it gets in the way of developmental schemes. He agreed to that. William K. Riley went on to become the leader, the uh, director of the EPA. And you might have heard his name in the newspaper back during the BP crisis. He was the guy President Obama tapped to come in and dispense all the money that he somehow got out of, out of the millions of dollars, billions that he got out of uh, uh, BP oil for that Gulf disaster. This is the guy that dispensed the money. Well, several years after this meeting in 1976, where the UN defined the relationship between man and property, and we went along with the deal, our government went along with it, this came along. Uh, the Brundtland Group put to, uh, the Brundtland Report called Our Common Future came up with this term called sustainable development. Now, not many people ever heard of affirmatively furthering fair housing, but how many people have heard of sustainable development? Raise your hand. Ah, big changer. Well, this is where it came from. Chapter 2 is called Toward Sustainable uh, Development. Now, sustainable development kind of has this loosey-goosey definition that can mean almost anything you want it to. It's development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Well. What does that mean? It can mean virtually anything you want it to. But the UN came up with a more precise meaning. You see, to the United Nations, if governments can control society, the economy, and the environment, if they're able to do that, well, then, in fact, we're now going to have a sustainable future. So when a, when a group like the United Nations signs off on something like this, and we didn't sign off on this yet. So right now, this is just a report. But they're talking about all of this, society, the economy, and the environment. So now we've got two pieces here. We've got this part where our common future, or the Brundtland Report, re displays the relationship between man and the environment. And the first report was, was the relationship between man and the property that he owns. Well, all of that came together in 1992, because groups like this, non-governmental organizations, they wrote this. They put this little book together. That's 40 chapters of what your nation has to look like. Now, again, this is the United Nations, so we don't really have to worry too much about this because, hey, this isn't us. This is them over there doing this. But in this book, they say some rather interesting things. You have to have a centrally controlled health care system. You have a centrally controlled educational system. You have, a cent have centrally controlled finances, centrally controlled businesses. And most importantly, property must be centrally controlled. It's too precious to be owned by individuals. Now, as I said, all of this probably wouldn't mean a whole heck of a lot because this was a United Nations thing that took place. Well, what happened was, a year later, if you notice, this is June 1992. In June of 1993, President Clinton formed a group called the Pre President's Council on Sustainable Development. And when he put that group together, he invited the folks over here that wrote that book he invited them to sit down with him and on a committee, whoops, with these folks over here. Those are our federal agencies. So this all happened back from 93 to 99. These groups met. And over here, you have the Department of Education. You got HUD. You got uh, the EPA, Department of Transportation. They were sitting at the same table together. So even though Congress never approved any of this, and they did, they, uh, actually, it did come up for a vote. This Agenda 21 actually came up for a vote. And I have records. I can show you the records of all that. The fact is, it never really went anywhere because they rejected it. So Bill Clinton said, well, that's not good enough. We're going to implement this through our federal agencies. And that's what he did. 
after these groups met, if we take a look at this, this is, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. What is this? <laughs> okay, this is from the federal agency, uh, from the Federal Register in 1998. And the parts that I've highlighted over here, I don't know if you can read any of that back there, so we'll kind of do it that way. This is the EPA's Challenge Grant Program, Sustainable Development Challenge Grant Program. So there's that word, sustainable development. All of a sudden now it's in the Federal Register. Raise your hand if you know what the Federal Register is. We're in there? Okay, those are our laws. This is all the stuff that Congress and the House and the President do. They pop them into the uh, Federal Register. Well, this grant is a also a step in implementing Agenda 21, the Global Plan of Action, uh, uh, Action on Sustainable Development, signed by the United States at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro back in 1992. There is no mistake that this is in federal administrative law. So if somebody tells you sustainable development is just something my, my planner wants to do, it's more than that. When your planner looks at sustainable development, he or she is probably just wants to help your community you know, last for a long time into the future, and that's a good thing. But whenever you get involved with the federal government, it has an entirely different meaning. So that's the piece that we as the citizens, if we're going to be informed, we need to understand that. Now today, there's a lot of documentation I could put in there. I haven't because we're, we're watching the clock here. However, if you look, the HUD, <coughs> HUD, DOT, and the EPA formed a partnership for sustainable, oh, there it is, the Partnership for Sustainable Communities. What they're doing is promoting exactly what I just showed you in the last few slides. The idea that, that, that um, communities have to be centrally controlled, the idea that property has to be centrally controlled. And it's done up till recently with this thing called the six livability principles. These livability principles, which I won't, won't go into a lot of detail, but provide more transportation choices, provide affordable housing. That sounds good. I'm in favor of all those things. But if you read them sentence by sentence, something emerges. For instance, develop safe, reliable, economical transportation choices to decrease household transportation costs, reduce our dependence on foreign oil, improve air quality, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, <clears throat> and promote public health. Okay, well, that's, that's a mouthful. But just wrap your head around it for a minute. You can't do this unless you get out of your car and you live in compact living. You can't. And if you put these six pieces together, all the way down to value communities, coordinate policies, and so on and so forth, you cannot implement the government's six livability principles without moving into a condensed area, very much like a region, or very much like the habitat that the United Nations was talking about many, many years ago. Now, all this is beginning to progress over time. So let's watch what happens here. <clears throat> this, these six livability principles are mandatory in every federal regional sustainable development grant. You can't get the money without getting this. Now, where did this all, you know, what, how did, how did HUD get into all this stuff? Remember, this one, this one was HUD. We talked about the EPA. Oh, by the way, if you want to know if this is still going on, this whole thing of sustainable development and the United Nations, three words, the path forward. Just Google them, the path forward, EPA. Got to get the fourth one. You got to get EPA in there. In January of 2012, the EPA released an internal document that said we changed the way we're making our decisions. Our decisions are now going to be based on sustainable development, but they don't stop there. They don't say just sustainable development. They say they're going to be based on sustainable development as reported back in the Brundtland Report back there in, uh, was it, 1987. They refer to it right in the documents. So all this stuff is there, which is just like uh, some of the money that Curtis was talking about that goes out the door and nobody's, nobody's talking about it. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Fair Housing Act of 1968 were implicit in all of HUD's development schemes. So when HUD takes an action, basically they say it's for affordable housing. We're trying to protect minority income groups. We're trying to help some of our, the, the poorer parts of our society uh, get a leg up and do, and do better. And that's an important thing to do. <clears throat> However, our president said in 2013 that we still have, in spite of all that HUD has done through the Fair Housing Act since 1968, in spite of all the work that we've done sending community development block grants into these various communities, in spite of all that stuff, the United States still has a leg legacy of segregation and discrimination. And the president said the reason for that is because HUD has been giving you guys, all these communities, all this money over the years, but we're not really paying enough attention. We're not managing the grant money at the local level. We need to do more of that if we're going to actually reduce discrimination and reduce and, and, uh, and have integration rather, rather than segregation. Now keep in mind, 
most of these programs will have livability principles in there. They'll have sustainability, sustainable development in there. When the federal government talks about sustainable development, it's not what your local planner is talking about when he or she talks about sustainable development. They may dovetail, but frequently very unknowingly. So we need to focus for a moment on what the government means by sustainable development, and that is control of private property, control of business, enterprise, society, e economy, and the environment. Affirmatively furthering fair housing addresses discrimination by advancing centrally controlled regional sustainable development. That's all it is. Affirmatively furthering fair housing is a rule that sits on top of several grants that the federal government offers, that, that HUD offers. That rule governs what you can and can't do with the money. So it's like a super set of strings. You ever heard that grants have strings? Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah, you take grants of strings. I want you to do certain things. Well, we just up the ante on the strings. So over here, if you accept HUD's grant, for instance, Community Development Block Grant, which, by the way, uh, uh, Greenville has accepted that. They also have this one, Home Investment Partnerships, uh, Emergency Solutions Grant, or the Housing Opportunities with Persons with AIDS. If you accept any one of these grants, then you fall under affirmatively furthering fair housing set of super strings, that I call it. But it goes further. See, that ruling in the Federal Register also says, if you take any of this money under AFFH, all of the money that your community takes, whether it comes from private or public funds, also falls under those strings. So if I came into your community and I said, oh, I got bundles of money and I'd like to give Seneca, or, or let's say, because I don't know if Seneca's taken HUD money or not, but I certainly know uh, uh, Greenville has. So if I said to Greenville, I'm going to give you a $5 million endowment you know, to build a, a new park, that falls under AFFH, even though it was private money. So this is quite expansive. Once AFFH goes into effect, they can reverse deci voters' decisions, as we said before, control your zoning, control your land zo uh, use, and they can force you to join a region. So the way they accomplish this is the application process, just filling out the very form to say, we want to apply for this money. Something, something companies have been doing, uh, uh, communities have been doing for years, by the way. This is nothing new. The form is new. The term affirmatively furthering fair housing, by the way, let me get this out now so everybody understands how this works. Affirmatively furthering fair housing is not a new term. It's been around since the 60s. I think it came in with the Fair Housing Act. So it's not a new term. The ruling is new. I've spoken to HUD officials who didn't know the difference. I mean, they're, they're supposed to know all that, and they didn't realize it. So you need to be one up and be aware of how that works. So AFFH as a, as a ruling is brand new. Uh, the way they get you to do all of these things, the way they're able to, the, the HUD uh, federal agency is able to reverse a voter's decisions is through the application process, creates legal liability, and I'm going to show you where the legal liability is, and then there's aggressive lawsuits that follow it up. So between creating legal liability for you and then following it up with lawsuits, you, you're going to find out there's not much place for you to go. This all started by, by the way, this whole idea of suing people and, you know, where did all this stuff come from? It came from a lawsuit. All, and, and this, by the way, this lawsuit is mentioned in HUD compliance reviews. It's mentioned in the Federal Register. This is the granddaddy. This is what triggered everything that we're talking about here today. Greg Gurian, who was the head of the Anti-Discrimination Center of Metropolitan New York, decided to sue Westchester County down here. Westchester County is in New York, outside of New York City. And they took, over a period of years, over $50 million from HUD. And they took that money for the purpose of affordable housing. And when they filled out the application, not the new one, but the old one, when they filled out that old application, they said, we are advancing affirmative, we are affirmatively furthering fair housing, and, there's, and we were working not to create any barriers. Greg Gorian came along, and he looked at that application, and he said, that's not true. There's barriers in Westchester County to affirmative, to affirmative furthering fair housing. So you lied on that. Therefore, I'm going to sue you for false claims. Now, the False Claims Act, in case you don't understand, if you fill out a form and there are, there are, uh, there's a penalty involved, it can be three times the amount of money that you received. So once Greg Gurian filed this against Westchester, they were facing the possibility of having to come up with over $156 million. So they went back and forth to court. And when they went to court, Westchester County lost. 
The court found <clears throat> that, in fact, Westchester had violated the False Claims Act by filling a form out and saying that we're doing everything we can, we can to prevent discrimination when this Greg said, no, no, you're not. It was HUD that decided whether or not they were, they, they were doing everything they could to prevent discrimination. They were ordered to build 750 low-income houses, and they lost their authority to a court-appointed monitor, monitor. If you go to Westchester County today, there's a court-appointed monitor. There's report cards from each little village within the county, and they have to fill them out and report that back to the court again. Well, Westchester County said, well, wait, wait a minute. You know, this is our buddy Obama in the, in the, in the office, because you know, this is 2009. So this is, our, this is our buddy in the presidency, and HUD's loaded with Democrats. We're Democrat. Westchester was a nice, good, uh, liberal town upstate New York, uh, in, just outside of the city, Manhattan. So I said, let's call HUD. So that's what they did. We'll reach out to HUD. They'll help us. Do you remember what I said before with all that, that HUD has a different agenda than you think they have? Well, our good liberal friends in Westchester County were in for the shock of their lives. Because when HUD got involved, they have sued them further for discrimination. They went after them, and they got even more. Westchester, then they said, uh, uh, HUD said that Westchester had to go beyond the provisions of the original court settlement. They said that's not enough. 750 homes is just a start. Low income housing needed to be near above average schools. It wasn't good enough to just build low income housing. You had to go to the better and the best schools and you had to put the income housing over there, the low income housing over there. Whoops. There we go. And landlords couldn't question the source of a renter's income. So sometimes landlords say, well, where's that money coming from? You know, how come you came here with a bundle of cash to pay me? Well, the administration says you can't ask anything about where that money came from. Well, a lawsuit went on for years and years and years, but, uh, which was just settled this year, by the way. So HUD didn't help. They made matters worse. But back in 2009, when that original, original settlement was done, Ron Sims, who was the Deputy Secretary of HUD, said, we're going to pursue similar goals across the country because this suing these outfits works great. So if we can sue a community, we can get almost anything we want out of them. Ron Sims, by the way, do you remember when I told you that little story in the very beginning about King County, Washington, 6510 rule, where if you own five acres of property, 65% of it had to be returned to its natural vegetative state? That was Ron Sims who did that. He was the county executive in Washington at the time. He was then promoted for such, doing such a great job, they promoted him to the Deputy Secretary of, of HUD. Well, the court decided, oops, where we go? Ah, there we go. In the Westchester versus HUD decision on September 25th of 2015, the court decided that uh, they had failed, the Westchester County had failed to affirmatively further fair housing. They were forced to return $30 million to HUD, and they had to spend another $30 million in affordable housing fees. So they had to, this had to come out of the, the, the uh, Treasury from, the, from, the local, from Westchester County. This settlement is fascinating in that HUD lost their case. They lost it. They went after them to prove discrimination, and they were not able to prove discrimination. But this was the key. By being able to say that they failed to affirmatively further fair housing, they were able to actually win the case. Now, remember I said there's a lot of litigation as we move forward with this whole rule. I'm going to, I'm going to apply it to Greenville here in just a minute. Well, that guy Greg Gurian, who I showed you a minute ago, remember old Greg over here? There's Greg. Oh, he's back here somewhere. There's Greg. There's Greg. Do you know what Greg Gurian got out of this deal? 7.5 million tax-free dollars. So if I can come into your community of Greenville, and I can prove that you filled out an application to HUD, and you said that we're affirmatively furthering fair housing, and in fact you're not, I can file, you, file for false claims, and I can get 30% of the settlement. Not a bad deal. His attorneys, uh, Alan Relman, uh, Dane, and Colfax, they got another $2.5 million. So all of a sudden, uh, I don't think I put this slide up here. No, I did. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, back in 2009 the, ink, 2009, the ink wasn't even dry on that original settlement with Westchester County, you know, where, where they had to build the 750 houses. That ink wasn't even dry. 
then HUD went after Marin County, which was just like Westchester County. It was a Tony upscale community, had a relatively low number of uh, 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 minority, minorities living there. They went after them, and in their compliance review, when they went after HUD, when, when HUD went after uh, Marin County, California, here's what they said. Affirmatively furthering fair housing and the precedent set by Westchester. This was written a month before the decision was even read. They knew where this, HUD knew where this was going. And they had already begun the documentation to go after communities. And they are going after communities with a vengeance who take this money. This is an excerpt from the EPA's Marin County, uh, com uh, uh, compl HUD, I should have said HUD, not EPA, from, uh, from HUD's Marin County Compliance Review. Now, the county agreed now, if you, look at, if you look online, I have all these documents, by the way. They're all available. You can, you can take a look at them yourself. It says a voluntary compliance review. Voluntary? There was nothing voluntary about it. If they didn't do what, exactly what HUD told them to, they'd, they'd have had their pants sued off. So there was nothing voluntary about this. They had to pass or, an ordinance for inclusionary zoning. They had to overcome any community resistance. Now, think about it. You ever heard of the term NIMBY? Not in my backyard. I don't want affordable income housing. You know, I spent my whole life so I can finally afford a really, really nice home, and now you're going to put a really, really inexpensive one next door. Now you're, now you're affecting everything that I've fought and, and worked for my whole life. Why would you do that? So that's called NIMBY. Now, politicians, many of them, are there, some, are there politicians in here? We got any? Oh, all right, good. Not all of them. But many politicians will take, well, we, you know, these NIMBY characters. Well, who do you think NIMBY are? That's the people who live in the community. That's who, yeah, that, this is quite valid, unless we're just doing this for special interest groups and a few contractors who want to make a whole bunch of money and some politicians in the background. The fact is, NIMBY matters. Not in my backyard is basically the people who live there saying, this is what we want our community to look like. Well, that had to be eliminated. Then also, they had to pass ordinances requiring developers to market outside of the county. So if a general contractor came in and said, we want to build some housing, they're now required to advertise outside of Marin County into areas where they have lower uh, um, African-American communities and Hispanic communities uh, in low-income areas and advertise to bring them into Marin County. But if you notice, they had to pass an ordinance, they had to pass an ordinance. Basically, HUD was telling these county commissioners what their votes were going to look like. They were telling them what to do. Now we're going to take a look. Uh, ah, yeah, okay. Sorry. They incorporated the legal lessons from Westchester into, into this ruling called Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing. So everything they learned now carries forward under this new ruling. So how does this work? How, does it, how do we create a liability for a local community? Well, you're going to fill out this form. And in this form, you have to, uh, it's called an Assessment of Fair Housing, an AFH. You have to put down uh, um, racially concentrated areas of poverty, ethnically concentrated areas of poverty. English proficiency, all these different areas that are protected groups. You have to list those. And then over here, on another side of the form, you have to list where your better schools, jobs, transportation, housing, parks, and recreational activities. And then the final step is you have to define anything that might be a barrier that would prevent uh, an ethically challenged area, where there's a concentrated area of poverty, from taking the same advantage of the better schools as anybody else in the community. If you don't close these gaps down so the people over here can take equal access to this, then in fact you're guilty of discrimination. And the whole idea is to, to remove discrimination here. So these barriers, which HUD calls contributing factors, they list in, the, in this, in this uh, assessment of fair housing about 40 of them. And some of them are opposition to for, affordable housing. So if your community says, well, I don't want affordable housing in our area, you know, we don't, we don't want to do that over here, put it over there somewhere. That, you have to be shut up. That's what they're saying. You have to be disqualified and discounted. Current zoning laws may be getting in the way. Lack of regional cooperation. This is important. Because remember I said that one of those three things that the HUD can do now is they can force you into a region? So if you fail to cooperate with that region, you can be sued for, under, under, for civil rights violations. And you're supposed to find more of these issues. And then you have to resolve them. Now, under HUD, you must involve the public in your AFH analysis. Here's what a lawsuit's going to come in. Do you remember I just told you you're listing all your deficiencies? Over, over here, these barriers are potential areas of discrimination because low-income families don't have the same access to the better schools that the, the high-income families do. Therefore, 
there's potential for discrimination. As you're filling this whole thing out, you have to invite civil rights advocates to participate with you in listing your areas of potential discrimination, affordable housing developers, community development groups, and any other person in the local community that wants to participate in that. So essentially, here I am, I've got all my liability hanging out because I just said, these are the things that we're doing in our community that might potentially be considered discriminatory. What's gonna happen if I don't close those areas down? If there's one person sitting in that meeting that sees what, where the potential areas for discrimination are, all I have to do is go back to HUD or threaten me to go back to HUD. Or maybe if I apply for money, they'll say, well, you know, you didn't fix these things. Therefore, that was a false claim. Therefore, huh, I'm going to get $7.5 million when this whole thing settles four years from now. You must be allowed to, these people must be allowed to participate. Now, as you're putting these plans together, HUD, you have, to have a, you have to have a plan. You, you, we've gone through all the, the, the data, and you have to, from that, create a plan to solve all these areas of potential discrimination. This, what I'm describing right now is what communities will go through as they accept this HUD money. This is a whole new process now. So I took a look here online. They have these geospatial uh, maps that you can access in HUD's website. And when, Re when uh, Greenville applies for HUD money going into 2016, they're going to have to go right here. And this little box will pop up on the geospatial maps. And they go and they find their area here. Well, son of a gun, Greenville, South Carolina, has accepted these two forms of grants. And they're an entitlement community, which means it's real easy for them to get the money. When you push one of these buttons, oh, down here, you see this where it says region? In that AFH that has to be filled out 77 times, it talks about regions. Why does it talk about regions so much? Because you're going to become part of that region, whether you want to or not. And HUD's already decided what the region is. It's Greenville, Anderson, and Malden. Is there a Malden in South Carolina? I don't know Malden. OK. Greenville, Anderson, and Malden. Now, if you already have a region of your own, which Greenville does, then it's very possible to go along, and, and HUD will be happy to use that. But you click over here whether you want to see jurisdictional maps or regional maps, and then you click Choose a Map. And when you do, you are now choosing between 17 different demographic maps that will pop up. You get now to pop on, hit on any one of these, and a demographic map will pop up. So this isn't live, so what I did is I just did a screenshot, and it's going to look something like this. This is the city of Greenville, South Carolina. This is the current 2016 demographic map, map for racial diversity in Greenville, South Carolina. And over here, we see all these little dots. I don't know if you can see them out there. And they're all color-coded over here. It tells you who's living there. But the big one is this pink border. Okay? And if you look down here, those are those R caps and E caps we talked about. And the federal government says you must eliminate them. It's no longer sufficient under HUD's grant uh, program in, uh, as it was in the past. In the past, you had to discourage discrimination. Now you have to stop it and eliminate it. That's in the law, and you sign off that you're going to do that. That means these areas have to go. So this, this CAP stands for Concentrated Area of Poverty. So over here, we have racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty in this part of, of Greenville. The airport's down here, so I guess a little north of that, of that area here. Well, these people have to be moved out of there. Well, where are we going to move them to? Well, here. We can now take a look at the region. This is the regional map that HUD has put together of Greenville, South Carolina. And this is Malden and, and uh, Anderson and so on and so forth. And what do we find? Son of a gun. There's more R caps and E caps over here and down here and over here. So all of these, we have to begin to move the people out of here and into other areas. Now, we go back to Westchester County. When Westchester County got in hot water, they had 15% minorities in their, in their area. That wasn't so bad. But the trouble is they were concentrated. So what HUD did, and the courts did, is they said, you have to pick these people up and put them over here. Pick these people up and put them over here. And that's exactly what Greenville is going to have to do. They're going to have to pick these, well, not literally pick them up, but you have to move people from one area to another. So what's happening to our minority groups, if you care about uh, uh, low-income minorities at all, they're being shoved around like pawns on a chessboard. And if you think any of this is going to reduce discrimination, you're wrong. It's not going to reduce discrimination. Can you imagine somebody who's, who's struggling to keep their, their payments up on their, on their house, and maybe now they've got a, a, a used car that they purchased, 
and now they're moving into this area where people are driving Jaguars and, and Mercedes Benzes. Do you think they're really going to have a whole lot in common over there with the, with, with the folks that they moved in? And the folks who are living there now, are they real happy that a $150,000 house went up next to their $750,000 house? Probably not real happy about that. So we're not really doing anything to eliminate discrimination. In fact, we're making it far worse than it ever was before. So this movement is what we talk about being, being forced into a region. When you complete your consolidated plan that you then submit to HUD, say, OK, here's our plan. These are the protected classes. These are the community resources. We're going to marry these two together. Here's our plan. We put it together with the region. What happens is the zoning laws that you write match the zoning laws of the region. They're identical. The only thing that creates a region is a zoning law. That's all it makes it. Once, they have, once the region controls zoning, they control everything. There isn't anything else to control. You just lost local authority. And it looks something like this. Oops, OK. Um, this may have been Greenville, or any city. This may be in the city. This may be in the rural area out here. But by forcing you to merge your two programs together, you, in effect, created a region out of it. You are a de facto region. So I said, we're going to overturn voters' decisions. We're going to control land use and zoning. And we're going to force you into a region. At that point, you've lost your autonomy, and you've lost your property rights. HUD will, oh, whoops. HUD says, and this, this, is, uh, this is maybe getting a little bit into the weeds, but I want you to understand this. I want, to, I want you to understand what you're dealing with here. If you read the Federal Register, it says this rule, affirmatively furthering fair housing, this rule does not impose any land use or zoning laws on any government. Well, that sounds pretty safe, right? Oh, we're OK there. Whew. We don't have to worry. Except if you read two paragraphs further, it says this. HUD will assist recipients to adjust their land use and zoning laws to meet their legal obligation to affirmatively further fair housing. So HUD isn't going to control your zoning laws. They're going to make you do it. They will force you. And how do they do it is, is this. It's the legal obligation. And the legal obligation is here. Greenville, and if, if you're part of the, this region, you too, Greenville will sign an agreement in which they agree to take no action materially inconsistent with a legal obligation to affirmatively further fair housing. That's legalese. And we know, because we run this by attorneys, Fox and Rothschild, and they said, this is establishing the basis for a False Claims Act lawsuit. In the last, between, in 2011 alone, HUD had initiated more lawsuits than they had done in the prior decade. And the only reason they've slowed down at the moment is because we're in the middle of an election year. HUD can follow through with HUD compliance reviews, loss of money, lawsuits. And the very same people that filled out that form with you are the people that are going to be suing you. Over here, I'm going to give you an example of one. This was uh, Rockford, Rockford, Illinois. In Rockford, Illinois, a planner, a, a developer came up and said, I think we should build 65 affordable homes. And the voters said, no, we only want 49. This was the mayor. The town council and the voters all agreed to build 49. HUD came through with a compliance review. And they, uh, they, HUD got wind of this meeting where they said they only wanted 49. Now, we don't know how they got wind of it, but it sure seems like the developer you know, dropped the dime on them. HUD came down like a hammer. They said, you're being investigated for civil rights violations, for failure to affirmatively further fair housing, and will probably refer to the case to the Department of Justice. That was the vote of the people. The mayor reversed the vote the next week. He said, OK, we can't do that anymore. HUD uh, lawsuits are being initiated across the United States right now. This is just some, Suffolk County, Sussex. These, uh, these are all administrative complaints. Uh, these are actual lawsuits. And there's a, a, a dozen more where these are. Uh, it goes just beyond that. This, this new uh, 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 ruling that HUD set up goes well beyond the, the purpose of just the lawsuit. Out here in Douglas County, Colorado, they actually analyzed the four, the, the, that full AFH document. And they concluded that some of the things are impossible to do in there. And sometimes when you clear up one problem or, or barrier, you're creating another barrier. So they said, we can't even do this for you. But they also realized this, that if they filled out this form, it would negate the county's rights and seriously hamper our ability to manage our local affairs. And that's the, that is the bottom line of it. If you get into this grant money, that's exactly what's going to happen. You will lose your rights. You will go into a, uh, a, a region. And uh, you, your votes will be overturned if they don't comply with what HUD wants. 
Westchester County, we talked about this decision. When they made that decision back in 2015, the, the second decision on Westchester County, they quoted Chief Justice Roberts. The courts figure that any group that takes this money has read the documentation. That if, if, Green, if Greenville decides that they want to take $2 million from HUD, that they read what those strings are. And therefore, they said this. If a party objects to a condition on the receipt of federal funding, your only answer is to decline the funds. There is no other answer. So we talked, when Curtis was in here earlier today, he was talking about how we have to stop, wean ourselves off of all this money. Remember that $22 billion they're taking out of the, out of the, out of the pension money and they're using it elsewhere because everybody just wants the money? These communities have got to say no to the money. I can't emphasize that too much. Going forward, if you say yes to this money, you will be con literally completely controlled, centrally controlled by the federal government. Please, well, okay, please say no to, re first of all, when you, when you form a region, you're making regional decisions. An unelected council comes along and they decide who's gonna live in your backyard. You can probably survive in a region until that unelected council comes in. But when that unelected, once that unelected council is there, all of a sudden you've lost your control over what happens in your local community. So you wanna stay out of the joining these formal regions, even though on the surface they sound very good. And you also wanna say no to HUD grants. Right now, just learn to live without them. I was up there in, uh, in Bill's community and we talked about, uh, I think it's about $3 million uh, your community gets from grant. We had a meeting up there with, with Bill's help and we were able to get the, the uh, attorneys and the public officials to begin to, to realize that we can't do this anymore and we have to make, create some kind of a plan to get out of this. So the answer to this really is very simple. The answer is say no. It's just say no to the HUD money. Now, um, I've covered an awful lot of territory awfully fast. I do want to show you one thing. Uh, it's just this one slide here. I wrote an e-book uh, a while, well, actually last week. <laughs> I put this e-book together. And in here, it describes everything that I've talked about. We have been weaned away from private property. You've been taught not to like private property. Our children, your children going in school have been taught not to like private property. If you, if you ever heard of Howard Zinn, who wrote the most popular history book used in high schools ever, over a million copies of them, in there he says in his history book, private property is a means of, of discriminating against women. It's oppressed women over the years. Now uh, you can read the thing and it'll tell you how it does that. This is a free ebook. Uh, it, it's available, actually if you give us, it, it's not even out yet, it's gonna be I, th I think out on Tuesday. Emily will pass around a, 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 a clipboard. If you'll put your email address on there, I'll see that you get this. Uh, I, I want you to read it, download it, print it, copy it, share it, whatever. I just want you to get it in front of as many people as you can. This also has the documentation of everything that I was talking about today. Another thing that we're doing is I have a thing called, a workshop called Shattering America's Trance. I just want to get this on your radar right now real fast. Shattering America's Trance is where we sit down with conservative people and we teach them how to talk to other people in the community. Because sometimes we conservatives, I'm, I'm a conservative, sometimes we conservatives tend to be a little heavy handed and overly enthusiastic in the way we try to describe our positions when we're dealing with others. Well, we need to, to tone down that rhetoric just a little bit. We run a whole full day workshop on that. I'm doing it all over the country. I just got back from Seattle doing one out there. Great response. We're going to put this online. So in the next few weeks, you're going to be able to actually just click, go online, and you'll download a whole bunch of good stuff. Folks, thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you.